I'm Amy and to intro this podcast episode, I work with clients who are navigating breakups or divorce, which is our topic for today, um, to help them navigate the process mindfully and respectfully and create a healthy environment for themselves, for their children, uh, to help them create new boundaried relationships uh, with their ex-partner and anyone else who comes into the family unit, you know, new boyfriend, new girlfriend, um, and help everyone understand their new role in the dynamic so everyone can stay in their lane uh, in a healthy and conscious way. And currently our culture has, uh, I think it's over 50% divorce rate. Uh, I think it's it's increasing. Um and there's lots of divorces that uh, tend to be nasty or bitter, and that can lead to our next generation being traumatized. So my work is to help guide adults uh, on a more mindful and mature path so they don't suffer as much, and particularly so that their kids don't suffer. That's an amazing intro, Amy. Thank you. I'm Sean. And uh, I'm a sex and love addiction coach. I also work uh, with people, with couples on their relationships, individuals mainly, uh, also divorce. Uh, I'm really big on 12-step, and Amy and I may come back around to have another discussion about that. But um, my ethos is often, you know, you're not alone. We don't have to go through any of this self-work, uh, self-help, self-care alone. And I really push the self-compassion button um, I was raised Catholic, Amy, so uh, none of that guilt or shame or any of that stuff works in my area. There's too much shame already with addiction, with divorce, etc. So I think we were talking before we recorded this podcast and we were like, uh, we don't do what, the, what we did in the 50s in America. That sort of stay together for the kids nonsense when it comes to divorce. Um, uh, I found that that didn't work. I ended up having a very healthy divorce myself. Um, I think that we realize that our families of origin, the generations, like you said, before us, um, they were just sort of trudging along and, and sticking with this negativity and being miserable. And then that, like you said, didn't help the kids and certainly wouldn't, uh, even in today's divorces, uh, be healthy for uh, the next generation. Kids growing up with divorced uh, parents or the parents themselves, the divorcees themselves. So looking for emotionally and psychologically and spiritually healthy folks splitting as amicably as possible, or, you know, just going to the neutral corners, like, you know, you don't have to talk all the time. But anyway, um, I like to say in my work that recovery didn't save my marriage, but it saved my life. And so um, I've always been curious, Amy, about the, um, the rancor of divorces, right? The why of terrible divorces. And I'm biased because I'm um, again, I'm blessed with a really healthy divorce. You know, we have our boundaries. We have our issues like everybody else. We have our boundaries. But um, I still, I feel bad for the families that I see that are like, oh my God, why are you still at each other's throats? Why are you sitting across the basketball court at the kids' games and not, you know, at least near each other, you know? You don't have to share hot dogs or anything at the game or nachos, but just be civil. Um, so I think today we're, we're going to talk a little bit about, with your expertise, um, you know, how to better set and reinforce boundaries, how to learn and uh, put into practice, you know, healthy rules of engagement. And I wanted to ask you, what do you see trending as far as um, healthy, cooler heads prevailing divorces versus bitter ones? Um, you know, like in my divorce, we had therapy right up until the end. Um, and I can go into that later, but I want to hear what you're thinking and what you're experiencing uh, in your work. Yeah, well, thanks for asking. Um, you know, there's a whole spectrum of vicious divorces and breakups to more mindful and conscious ones. Uh, and the the angry, bitter split, it seems like an easier sort of a default path. You know, as humans, our brains skew negative. We have a built-in negativity bias. Um, and so we're programmed to ruminate on the negative and we're programmed to move into that uh, blame victim mode. Uh, and often families and friends with the best of intentions, they encourage and feed into that when you're going through uh, a split, a divorce, breakup. Um, but ultimately, it has been my experience I've seen with my clients that 
putting in the work to create a respectful, healthy framework for your split and for your new relationship dynamic makes things much smoother in the long run. And it takes maturely putting your ego to the side. It takes, you know, putting your, putting on your big kid pants, um, prioritizing your children. Absolutely. If there's children involved, prioritizing the children, that's the big picture. That's the, that's the long game. Uh, you know, holding on to anger and maintaining that frustration or that victim mentality, whatever you want to call it, it's exhausting. Um, and even if you have the most supportive family and friends, holding on to bitterness and, and living in that victim mode, you're going to run out of couch time with your friends and family. You know, you're, they're going to run out of patience with you. They, they're going to run out of patience listening to your story being told over and over again. Um, and also, if you're forward thinking, bitterness and resentment is super unattractive to your next potential partner, your next potential mm -hmm. relationship. Um, you know, yeah, if you start dating again after a split, one of the first questions is going to be, how's your relationship with your ex? No one wants drama. No one wants it, wants to walk into a volatile situation. Um, so from a mindfulness and spiritual perspective, everything is energy. So if you are spending negative energy on your ex, it's still energy. And that's energy that you then don't have available to spend on yourself, to spend on your kids, or to spend on your next potential partner. You know, it's, it's not attractive. That's an awesome note. Um, have you gotten any notes from clients about jealousy when you do share that you're getting along with your ex? Have you heard anything? But probably not as predominant, but you know what, that? Sean, it it goes both ways. So some people are more comforted when two exes hate each other because they know there's no hope of them getting back together. Although that's that 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 actually is a fallacy but um some some you know new new people uh new potential partners want you to hate your ex mm. some hate drama so much and want to avoid drama at any cost that they would much prefer that you get on well and have a civil relationship with your ex mm. and the um truthfully the chances of two exes reconciling is probably equal regardless of what the situation is. So even if you seem to hate your ex, you know, love is not the opposite of hate. Um, so my, my advocation is don't do it because you think it's, um, you know, something, you know, what is my potential partner going to want? Do it because it's right for your kids. And mm -hmm. no drama is so much healthier for your kids. Li growing up in a stressful environment is really detrimental for kids. So, um, so that, that's my number one priority is, is the welfare of the kids. I love it. I love it. I can totally relate. And I'm sure we're going to get more into it as we keep talking. Um, the thing my ears also perked up, we have a whole list here of, of questions to go back and forth. So we have plenty of fodder for the canon, but um, my ears also perked up when you shared about family asking questions and whether it's out of curiosity, whether it's out of love, you know, holding space, or like in my case, whether they are fucking livid that you broke up, they're Catholics, they're hardcore, they're conservative. Um, we, uh, with my divorce, not only was it, were we experiencing the pain of the divorce, which of course it was like, you know, I mean, we came to it very, um, we really worked to get to that point. We tried as hard as we could, but oh my God, the families, both sides doubling down on us. Oh, Amy, it was terrible. You know, whether they meant it out of love, but it was coming out sideways because they were just so hurt. Like we were hurt or whether they were just frankly assholes, um, we got both. And so we, even as we're divorcing and separating and, and, and like physically and emotionally and everything, we had to circle the wagons because we were mm -hmm. getting all these, uh, you know, gunshots, emotional gunshots yeah. blasted at us while we were divorcing. It was terrible. 
Yeah. So that's actually fairly common, Sean. And the reason is uh, for for what you had said, which was that, um, you know, religion played into it. Um, also, our cultural norms, you know, indicate that relationships are good. Breaking up is bad. And, and, and that's kind of a, you know, th that's kind of a hard and fast rule across our, our culture. Um, it's not healthy and it leads people to stay in unhealthy or toxic relationships for too long. Um, but definitely uh, religion plays into it, culture plays into it. And then also, um, you know, our, the past generation. So you're talking about, you know, your families and, and potentially your parents, um, they're of a different generation. So I actually, one of the main things that I, that I um, caution clients on when they are about to um, have the conversation that, you know, tells their family and their friends that they are going to go through a divorce is to prepare yourself that this is going to trigger things in people and their response may be supportive and loving and unconditional. And, you know, I love you. I support you. What do you need from me? Which is the fantastic response to something like this, or it may bring up, it may trigger something in them that is um, going to come out sideways on you. And mm -hmm. so I, I really caution people when they're going into that because that's often something that couples are not or individuals are not prepared for when they go in to have a conversation with. They you may lose family or friends through this. Um, you know, yeah, you may be getting a talking to you, you. They this, although from your perspective, this is just about the two of you or your family unit. From their perspective, they may say may see that they have a vested interest in this, and this isn't right, and they don't want this to happen, and they don't want to lose, you know, your ex um, in their life. What are their friends going to think? What's the church going to say? What's all of that? So there's mm. there's tons of layers of this stuff that kind of falls down on the couple as they're splitting. Um, so that's definitely something that I would uh, caution people about before you kind of announce or before you go into it, just be prepared that some people are going to be super supportive. Some people are not. And, yeah. and in terms of their friends too, um, in terms of your friends, it, it, it may trigger in them. Um, you know, there's sort of a, a saying that, you know, divorce can be contagious, which is that when, when one couple splits, you know, climbs up that mountain and is like, Hey, we're not, we're not happy. We're going to split. Um, it often triggers in other people couples the hey we're, we're, let's re-examine our relationship like are we really happy is this really going the way we want it to go and so um seeing one couple go through it can often have a, a bit of a domino effect so so that also may, might be why some friends or family are um are reacting negatively to it because they're actually it's it's not you, it's them, you know, it's something, mm -hmm. it's triggering something in their own relationship. The contagion thing is amazing. I've never heard that before. And that would have been a good thing to get some coaching on we need <laughs> the feedback like that. But also the first thing that you said, it would be amazing to get that heads up ahead of mm, time because yeah. it really just compounded it, it like doubled down. We were yeah. already, we, you know, we needed the divorce. We wanted mm -hmm. it. But you're still fucked up emotionally. You're still sad, sure. angry. You know, you're still going through all the things. And even as amicable as ours was, um, the emotions would flare up, of course. And then you have just that extra pressure, an entire whole layer, additional layer yeah. of, oh, my God, what are you guys doing? It's like, really? You're going to fucking judge us right now? This is yeah. – you literally are kicking us when we're down. Yeah, this is you, feel like you're, you feel like you're fighting on all sides. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And it's – and... I... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, it, which is why I was I was using the exactly what you're saying, fight on all sides. That's why we use the circle of the wagons, and we still yeah. kind of use that um, that uh, analogy to this day. Yeah, it's um, it's really a, an element of splitting up that people don't see coming, um, and and hopefully, it encourages you to be completely unconditionally supportive and non-judgmental when anyone else in your life goes through it because you know mm. that the the only appropriate response is i love you 
I support you. What do you need from me? What mm. can I do? You know, that's it. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, I wish. And yeah, I, I can imagine your work, you know, helping instilling that in folks. Like, just say <laughs> this and everything will be fine. Um, what about uh, when we were when we were planning this podcast, we talked about um, different dynamics, different versions of divorces. Um, is it any less rancorous when you pack your shit, you know, divvy up your property and a pet as opposed to when um, kids are involved? Because when kids are involved, as with my divorce, you, know, you will still have not constant interaction, but regular interaction with this person you just decided to like walk away from your intimate relationship with. So what can you say about the, the sort of distinctions, compare and contrast? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yes, I think there is definitely a different end game without kids. You know, without kids, the relationship can, in effect, end. Now, from a spiritual perspective, relationships never start or end. But on this, for what we're talking about, um, without kids, the relationship ends. You guys go your separate ways, and it was a chapter in your life, and that chapter is over. Um, with kids, the relationship doesn't end. It just shifts into a different relationship dynamic. And so that needs to be navigated. And again, I would advocate to, to navigate it with mindfulness, with respect, with grace. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Can I say that the few times my ex and I, I keep remembering, don't say her name, give her, keep her anonymity. Um, <sighs> The few times my ex and I have mentioned, you know, I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm from Northern California and we met in Southern California in LA. And uh, I had no idea I'd be out here 16 years later, you know, um, and I didn't leave specifically because my kids are out here getting raised out here. And I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to do the once a month dad thing and go mm -hmm. back to California. But it's been, it's really interesting what feels come up in me when, you know, my ex will be like, uh, kind of remind us, oh, well, you know, you probably wouldn't even be here if we didn't have our two teens, you know, you, who knows what our lives would have done. And it's not used in a negative way. It's just, it's just the fact of exactly what you're saying is different end games. Like, oh my God, yeah. that would have been, life would have been totally different. But anyway, and also to, to spin that, not spin it, but to think of it in a far more positive way is, you know, we have this incredible bond as friends, as mm -hmm. divorcees, as co-parents, and, um, you know, we have these two beautiful kids around whom we orbit and, you know, are building these two humans. So I'm good with all that. And we were blessed in that. But, um, yeah, when she, yeah. it gets existential almost when she mentions that, I'm like, oh my God, I wouldn't yeah. even be here with all my friends, my support, my sobriety, totally different story, you know, I've talked about, but, um, yeah, it's, it's wild. Yeah. To think of that hypothetical. So anyway, um, what did we have? What do we have next? We had. I think we're going to talk about a collaborative divorce, and then I'm going to ask you. Oh, 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 oh! Is this Lisa Herrick? Is this Dr. Herrick? Mm -hmm. I think so. She has. Oh yes. So I found this article. Thank you for getting back on track. <laughs> <laughs> I found this article from Dr. Lisa Herrick, individual therapist, couple therapist, collaborative divorce uh, guru. And um, she's got her own website, and I just like some of the things she broke down. And some of the guidelines, uh, this is sort of just a couple of questions I was going to bounce off you as the expert, some of the guidelines she goes through and sort of uh, puts out there to help people in the first couple of months of separated family life and then adjusting to a long-term uh, divorce, all the changes that come with that. And one was... A uh, question that I had that you were going to answer, and this is something that she brings up. Is it true that kids can see through a parent pretending or faking it till they make it when it comes to like immediate post-divorce? Can the kids sense it? You know, maybe my ex and I are just good actors and, and we actually are. We actually did some acting back in the day. She wasn't acting. But, um, you know, how, how much of that do you think bleeds or can be sensed, you know, or is sort of intuitive by the kids or can you do a good job sort of shielding them from the intricacies, the inner, the, the guts of it. I think, um, I think that kids definitely sense tension. So um, as we were talking about before, parents who stay in relationships that are unhealthy, that are not functioning um, for too long. I think the kids, even if you're not overtly fighting in front of kids, I think that kids definitely sense stress and tension. Uh, in terms of after the split, 
I think that intention plays a huge role here. So respect, in my opinion, is key. If you, um, you know, you can be angry or frustrated with your ex, but if, if you at least have respect for them and attempt to navigate this without traumatizing your kids, then I think your, your intention is, is what really matters here. And I think the kids can sense that. Yes, you might not be, you know, you might be slightly faking it till you make it, but I think if your intention is for the greater good, then I, I think your kids will sense that. You mentioned uh, one or two words that were key in our couples therapy, even before the last run of couples therapy, before the divorce. I feel all solipsistic, like I keep just refer- self-referencing. <laughs> Are we going to talk about your personal life at all? Is this just going to be Sean in the hot seat? Let's just Sean in the hot seat. I love it. Sean in the hot seat. You're, you're, you're like, fuck it. We're not messing. We're not messing with Amy Brown's story today. No. Um, but please interject wherever you like. Um, uh, one thing that you mentioned, I remember from early therapy when we were already having tensions and I was also still in active addiction. So the tensions weren't going to go away just from the therapy. Like I had to get sober first and that came way later. But, um, I remember the therapist, this wonderful woman, Karen Bryant, um, MFT in Beverly Hills, California, go check her out. She was like, you guys are good as long as you respect each other, which is what you just mentioned. And that the resentment doesn't burn too hot. If you get yeah. into resentment and then you get into disrespect, you're yeah. fucked. You, yeah. might, you, you could just walk away now before yeah. it gets, again, where we started, rancorous. Yeah, it's really hard to come back from that. When when the respect is gone um, and the resentment builds, it's it's literally like a, like a pile of stuff growing between you. And mm. it's really hard to shovel your way out of that. Yeah. So respect is respect is huge. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, couples who are trying to who are really trying and navigate, you know, maybe they're not there yet uh, in terms of having a really civil relationship. But as long as they're trying, as long as their intention is good, I think they can um, they respect each other in the new role that they have in terms of the new family dynamic. I think that's huge that and kids will sense into that intention in that respect. Am I, there are a couple more questions here from Dr. Herrick that I was going to throw your way, but uh, two things. Do you, do you not cuss? Am I just the foul mouth asshole on this, on this podcast? You just said a pile of stuff. I'm like, oh my God, have I, should I have been self-censoring this whole time? I, I don't mean to offend your, your ears. <laughs> if I, I swear only when I really want you to pay attention. <laughs> like okay, when okay. I, when I swear you'll notice. That's okay. Sure. Got it. Well, I ruined my teens because by like, eight, same thing with my with my siblings who are like more than a decade younger than me um you know they came back from a trip in LA hanging out with me cussing like sailors my mom says <laughs> I cuss my team's now cuss there's nothing any of us can do so I apologize it's all good no um, I like it I like it okay. <laughs> <laughs> speaking of communicating and cussing and all that um I see a note about uh, to myself about keeping the lines of communication open with the children sort of like checking in see how they're feeling about time apart time together Mm -hmm. um uh, you know do we do we talk about them do we talk with the kids directly about accepting the sadness as something normal you know we have to get a a, a, an idea of what they're going through right Mm -hmm. i mean it's not just send them off to a to a to a therapist or child psychologist it's like how open should the divorcees be with sitting down with their own kids and and letting them share their shit yeah, well, I think every situation is going to be unique, but I think a blanket statement, your responsibility as a parent is to hold space for your kids to emote and to process this, not putting your emotions on your kids, uh, but also not being emotionless, not being stone cold. Um, so it's a delicate balance to find your role. You know, this is a, this grieving and healing process is not linear. So um, it may come for you or for your kids now or in a month or seemingly out of nowhere. Um, You know, and I always caution that milestones can be tough. Um, Like, you know, the first Christmas since the split or Mm. the first birthday since the split or whatever, that can be that can be a real time of of um, of confusion, of emotional release, of, you know, shifting into the new, the new situation. 
Mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. I don't know if it's gonna. It may just necessitate a second podcast on this exact same uh, topic. And again, maybe because I'm feeling self conscious about it being this, you know, the the me show. But um, <laughs> I'm appreciating your answers. And there are so many scenarios that are popping up as we're recording this. You know, uh, when my son was really upset as a toddler one time, where it just all came out, right? Like we were all evolving into this new version of ourselves, but one day he just just lost it. And it was like the most poignant thing. It was like, oh my God, you just have to sit there and hold space. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, one thing that's been kind of a more recent change is what does the unit look like um, in the divorce? So for a long time, uh, I was single and it was basically four of us, two kids and then two divorcees. And then it became five when um, my ex started dating the man who is now her husband, the kid's stepdad. He's been a great stepdad and very supportive. And we're all, it was very cool. I will tell you this, um, again, self-serving share. No, but uh, that it was really interesting. What my ex did, she really stuck a, a flag in the relationship, even in divorce, and was like, Sean comes with the package. Mm-hmm. Yes, we're divorced, but we are co-parenting. So she made a real clear boundary um, with a couple of people she dated before and then with a man she ended up marrying. So I always thought that, that was really cool. Awesome. But yeah, also that's great. That, yeah, yeah, I thought that was pretty deft um, yeah. because we, we, we'd done it more messily before. I don't know if that's an adverb, but, you know, it was kind of messy. And I was like, I don't want to meet so-and-so. And I'm all getting resentful and in my feels about her dating and stuff. Anyway, the... <laughs> What, but what, what's been more recent with me was actually disallowing her joining and not out of any kind of negativity, but letting it be me and my kids. We have our traditions, mm-hmm. you know, we, we had a lot of traditions that we were building with the four of us, even in divorce. Um, I used to, uh, um, <laughs> post-divorce was, was, was hell. I didn't have a car. I had a brand new job. I was busting to work as a 40 something year old, but what was really cute was the kids used to drive by with their mom on the route where I was literally crossing the street to go into my offices um, as they were on the way to school when they were still great in grade school. And so I think, I think what I was going to ask you was how mindful do you have to be about, you know, mama's going to come with us this time. Mama's not going to come with us. It's coming up now again, because I have a girlfriend I'm very serious about. And so it's like, well, guys, when do you want to meet this person? Because she's in my life. And so how do you sort of negotiate that, you know, with the kids? Like, it's going to be three of us. It's going to be four of us. It's going to be all five of us. I feel like I I can keep my space if I just want to be the three of us. And sometimes my ex will ask, oh, can I go to dinner with you? And I'm like, "Mm, no, no, I think I just want my space with the kids. Last night, it was just our son and my ex and me and the stepdad and our daughter went home after an event, after my daughter's like dance event. Um, I don't know if that was kind of a loose, vague question. (laughs) Yeah, no, no. I I think, um, so I think there is no one size fits all for that. So, you know, there's on the one extreme, there's some uh, new family units who with their new partners all together end up going on vacation to get, you know, uh, together. That's, uh, that's their prerogative. Um, And then for other people, they're just good if they can all make it to the kids' graduation and they, you know, as you were sort of saying, like, they, you know, they sit separately. They don't, you know, as long as they can just not argue, they can be in the same room and not argue, that's fine. Um, so it really depends on the situation. It depends on the kids. It depends, you know, as I keep coming back to my my strongest advocate, advocacy is for what makes the kids feel comfortable. And so that would be how I would, that would be how I would figure out how to navigate that process is what do the kids want not that the kids dictate everything but if the kids are comfortable if the kids like the new partner if the kid you know fantastic I think couples new divorce couples tend to rush into introducing kids to the new partner that's some that is something that I yeah that I really um, advocate strongly with, with clients is pump the brakes on introducing your new partner. You, you, you don't want to, there's so many reasons, but I'll just give a couple top 
top level ones, you don't want to have your kids meeting a stream of people. Um, but also, you're, if you're, let's say you're dating someone new, and this is someone that you really care about, someone that's serious in your life, you actually want your kids to come in completely open-hearted, completely trusting, and you want your kids and that person to invest in each other. So you want your kids to really invest in getting to know this person, getting to love this person, and having a connection with this person. If this is someone that is then going to leave your life or not be in your life for the long term, your kids will be significantly less willing to come in open-hearted to the next relationship or to trust anyone else, including mm. you. Um, that you know, like gun shy. Yeah, exactly. Because you're an adult, you go into a relationship, you know what's at stake, you know that your heart might get broken and you know that the relationship may not last, might not last forever. And that's okay. As an adult, that's what you go into. You, you know, you know what the risk reward is. As a kid, you're kind of collateral damage. You know, you don't, mm -hmm. you, the kids have no power in choosing this person. They have no say in if this person is in your life forever or not. And it, your kids can be equally invested in this person and then they get their heart broken, which is it. Now you can't ever completely vet the person and predict whether or not the relationship is going to last forever, of course, but the longer you delay it, the more you know whether or not this person is, is in it for the long term. Mm. So that would be my, my, that's my strong suggestion is to, Take your time introducing the kids to the new partner because you want to make sure that the partner is going to be in your life for a long time. Otherwise, the mm -hmm. kids are risk. You're risking your kids getting their heart broken as well. I think if you were coaching me back in the day on divorce, I think I would have gotten four out of five stars, uh, Amy. <laughs> Amazing. Maybe, maybe even four. Maybe even four and a half. I think um, you would have. I <laughs> <laughs> It's just one big ego stroke podcast. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> I love the, it. The the um two things were a factor in how we um handled exactly that introducing people. One was um uh, in my childhood I had a lot of uh dating, a lot of just too many people I was being introduced to when my mom was single before um she married my dad, my namesake dad, Cardinali. Uh and two, um so I didn't want to repeat that. But also, I just wanted coming out of, you know, my 12-step story. Again, we're going to do a separate 12-step podcast. Mm -hmm. um, coming out of sex and love addiction and codependence and hyper-enmeshment and bad boundaries and the resentments and the bullshit that build up with that. When I started to date, finally, a little bit after my, um, my ex did when we were divorced, I, I actually had a girlfriend. I think she was a little frustrated. She wanted everyone to sit at the table, her kids, my kids, and everything. And I was like, I am really enjoying this. But um, you're, you're not going to meet my kids. They're my kids. Mm -hmm. They're my sun and moon. And like you're saying, I wasn't just going to have them as collateral damage. I wasn't going to sort of, it would have been too experimental mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. to introduce them too soon. Like, hey, we're just going to try this out and see what fucking happens. No, no. And I mean, you can't control every variable. That's why it's a variable. But what I did have, what I could manage was we're going to wait a while. And in fact, we ended up, I was shockingly broken up with, <laughs> and I say shockingly not because I'm all that. I it was it was a surprise. It was a really sudden breakup. I was like, whoa, what happened? And we don't need to go into that. But I was so grateful then. I was like, oh mm -hmm. my god, thank God I didn't yeah. introduce my two little loves to this to this yeah. woman because I cared for her. But we were still, and we weren't just dating. We were monogamous and everything. But no, I'm so glad. Cause it was only, it was like six, seven months or something, if that. And I was yeah. like, oh my God, thank God I didn't bring the kids into that. Yeah. And I, I would always suggest to clients when you are starting to date again, let it be about you. Let it be just for you. You know, this is, it, it, it feels a bit awful because you are for a while leading a bit of a double, double life where you've got your kids on one side and then you've got this relationship and your kids, I would suggest don't need to know about your dating life. They don't even know, need to know that you're going on dates, you know, because then they start having, you know, thoughts about the future and thoughts about the past. And it can cause all kinds of, you know, imagination stuff going on for them. Um, but 
let the dating initially, let it just be about you. Let it just be about you having fun connecting with another adult human. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Love that. Like, just, just stay with that. That's a great transition to what I wanted to ask you about uh, this next part. Um, Because I don't want people who are listening to this thinking that this is just about co-parenting and divorce, but divorce and this whole series is single on purpose. So folks who are divorced are single, maybe, or often won't have the kids in play. Um, But I do want to go back to how two individuals will feel particularly rancorous, or it's just a, a messy, you know, ugly, difficult split. Um, and so I was reading, there's this LCSW, uh, Susan Peace, I'm going to not say her last name correctly, mm-hmm. Gadua, I think, G-A-D-O-U-A. And she had up this article in Psychology Today saying, feeling hatred is normal in divorce. And I was like, wow, hatred is a really strong word. Um, I would think resentment, I would think uh, again, I kind of like rancor because it's not that, but so she's saying it's, it's, it's intense, it's normal. Um, and part of what she's saying is that trust has been betrayed. And so a natural response to that kind of damage, um, is this hatred, this like really hot resentment. Um, and that some people need that hatred to justify leaving the relationship. It's, um, Yeah their intense anger is used to sort of repel them and split them more decisively. Maybe what do you, what do you think about that? Well, I, from a spiritual or conscious perspective, everyone is is in our lives for a reason, a season or a lifetime. And every, yeah, I love that one. Um, Mm. And it's something we need to remind ourselves, right? We, we think everyone is a lifetime. No, it's not a reason, a season or a lifetime. And every relationship is a lesson and an opportunity to act from a place of love. So if someone treats you with love, then it's easy to treat them with love right back. But some of our biggest opportunities for growth come when we're given an opportunity to treat someone with love and respect, even when they don't treat us with love and respect. Uh, Now, to be clear, I am not advocating staying in an abusive or unhealthy relationship. Absolutely not. I'm not advocating being a doormat. Absolutely not. But I'm offering a conscious perspective on splitting up. Um, You can feel anger and sadness. Absolutely. And you can create boundaries to keep yourself safe. Absolutely. And then you can have compassion or respect or love for the person. Um, you know, I, I think holding up healthy boundaries, I'm a huge proponent of healthy boundaries, absolutely. Uh, but when we're in a place of suffering, our ego tends to get triggered and tends to lash out, throw things at someone. We tend to, to react rather than responding. Mm-hmm. And mindful awareness and, and healing and, you know, consciousness is, is a brilliant way to put a pause between the stimulus and the response so that we can respond rather than react. Um, awareness is a brilliant tool and, and it's brilliant to have, to have the curiosity um, and to observe and then to be able to respond in a more conscious way. Because, you know, the truth is we, we never, when we're angry, we're, we're never angry because of what we think we're angry for. Um, Often, you know, anger can just be a signal to us that we're tired, that we lack patience um, in the moment. We, you know, we tend to snap or react versus responding. And if we just kind of take a moment and you get curious and you ask yourself, why am I angry right now? You know, um, where is this actually coming from? What is this digging up for me? You, <clears throat> you were saying that this is just the, the Sean Share podcast. So my uh, a personal... Um, story from uh, last week. I, my ex-husband asked me to get a birthday present for a birthday party that my son was going to. And in the moment, it just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And I got, you know, I got kind of frustrated, not hatred, but, you know, just just frustrated. Um, And I thought, you know, I paused. I thought, okay, Amy, why, why are you frustrated right now? 
I, I, you know, I, I love the person whose birthday they're going to. I love my son. I don't mind getting birthday presents. Why am I getting? And I realized, okay, it's because he, my ex right now is on a ski trip with his friends mm. and I would love, you know, that. And then I thought, and then I paused again. I thought, no, no, I, I'm actually happy for him. To, it's not, that's not it. I'm actually happy for him to be on a ski trip because I love when he, he's always in a better mood when he comes back from a trip with his friends. So, so it's not that. Mm. And then I dug deeper and dug deeper. And I said, it's actually because I haven't allowed myself to take a vacation in way too long. So it's, mm. so it actually has nothing to do with my ex, has nothing to do with the birthday party or the birthday gift. It has to do with me. I'm the mm. problem. You know, as Taylor Swift says, I'm the problem. It's me. I, it has mm. to do with, I haven't given myself the opportunity, but if I ha hadn't, if I hadn't had that mindful curiosity to say, what is, what's with this? Why am I, why am I reacting right now? I could have easily snapped at him, but I didn't. I said, I said, instead, I was like, Amy, take a vacation, take a freaking vacation. That's what you, that's what you need to do. That's what's underneath it yeah. all. Uh, th look at that. We got a slice of your life finally. And not just, <laughs> just, just all my shit, my dirty laundry out there. But what your share reminds me of is um, early on, um, I can't remember if it was a sponsor or a therapist, but they they really drilled it into me that anger is one of the secondary emotions. Mm -hmm. There's a, like you like you just said, there's always <clears throat> something below. And look mm -hmm. at how you tunneled down and found that it was about yourself, yeah. and not about your ex at all. At all. Um, and, and I think so much without the training, without the therapy, without the spirituality, without whatever foundation we're building up for ourselves. Um, yeah, you just go to that reactive. And right. So that that's uh, that's amazing too. That it came back around to you, not yep. just that you had the tools, <laughs> but that you're like, oh shit, this is like I just need a vacation and stay on. Yeah. Like, don't be mad at him for that. Yes. Because uh, he's asked me to go pick up a toy. Or yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And it often, when we circle it around, you know, when we dig deep enough, it often circles around right back to ourselves. Yeah. So if someone is coming to you, though, I, I kind of because the language that. Um, that Dr. Uh, P. Skadua, or I'm just going to say Skadua. I, I apologize, mm -hmm. Dr. Susan, mm -hmm. um, or LCSW. Um, if someone comes to you specifically with the hatred, because I can't, I mean, I'm a, I'm a wordsmith. I'm a grammar snob. I'm a wordsmith. I'm a writer. Hatred's a big fucking emotion and a big word, and, and it holds a lot of weight. If someone's coming to you with that, and they're just recently divorced or divorcing, what do you do to help unpack or mitigate or cool the heat of the hatred? Because you're talking about mindfulness and, and all mm -hmm. that, but how do you how do you introduce those concepts to them in the first place? Like just a a cool out moment. <clears throat> yeah, um, I think that one of the um, one of the key elements for couples who really you know, they're, they're, it's going to be a long journey back to getting respect for each other, back to getting the, to the point where they can have a civil relationship, back to the point where they can actually work on their, their dynamic together. Um, if we actually go way spirit, way onto the spiritual side, in terms of everything being energetics, we, we actually disconnect on an energetic level because when, when someone has that hatred, as I said, as I said much earlier, if you are if you are spewing hatred at your ex, that is still energy that you're using, and it's then not energy that you have for, to work on yourself and heal yourself, focus on your kids, or focus on you know any anyone who potentially comes into your life. So we actually work at it on an energetic level to um, cut cut ties. We call them cut cords. Um, so in when you have a, a relationship with anyone, but particularly an intimate relationship, you end up forming energetic cords that are connecting you with the other person. And we have to work on energetically, so not being in each other's face, but actually just from you, one person can do it on their own, energetically disconnecting or energetically cutting those cords, cutting those ties. Now, I also would recommend that in this, you know, in this 3D world that you also cut 
as many connections with your ex as you possibly can, you know, like bank account and, you know, split your assets, but you split everything so that you don't have to have interaction as much interaction with them with the exception probably of, you know, co-parenting. But um, we also attack it from a, an energetic perspective because I think that, uh, as I said, it, hatred is not the other side of love. Um, there's still a lot of emotions there. It's a very, very fiery energy going on there. Um, and so from an energetic perspective, we, we focus on, on cutting those cords, cutting those ties. Sean, um, my, my, um, I'm going to have to move because my computer, it, I, I need to plug it in. Okay. Um, okay. So Brandon, Brandon, Brandon a yeah. Pause. Yeah. Brandon, if you can cut this part out and Sean, do you think, yes. uh, cause it's kind of, I don't want it to go too, too long. Should we, I know we're already, at I know, I know. Um, should, what should we, I had an idea that yeah. if you're on page, what page is this? This fucking Google docs. I hate Google docs. Five. Yep. On five, I thought from what you just shared, mm -hmm. I was going to go into, I don't know if you can see me highlighting, um, what now, there's a what now question you, yep. you talk about cultural, religious, and then I was going to go into, I kind of like moving into the SOP stuff because that's what this yep. podcast is. And you can give that answer um, where I'm like, uh, uh, um, everyone's yep. timeline. So my sponsor and therapist both had me single on purpose. So you want to do those two and then see if we can wrap up there. Yeah, I can't believe there's literally like, half I know. of our notes left. I know, so I know. It'll be a three-parter. <laughs> That's okay. Exactly. Um, and then do you, are you good with me then going to the um uh um how do we get to the end part where we're talking about um because of the, the you so don't despise your spouse part or no? No, no, no. We, yeah, we can do, we can do whatever you want. Um, but I was just thinking, I, I wanted to intro, um, saying the 12 step. Like I want at the very, very last oh, sentence. Yes, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. I, I have you, to go plug in. Hold on. Hold yeah, on. Go, 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 you go ahead. Figure, All right. See what you want to do. Hold on a second. Okay. <laughs> Brandon, we're still on a hold here. You're going to be cutting out all of this. One second. I don't even know if I can pause the recording. I, I kind of don't because I, yeah, I don't know if you could pause. Brandon, we're still pausing. Okay, sorry, Sean. We're gonna have to. Um, Whatever you need to do, it's all good. Move out of the recording closet. All right. Because there's no outlet. There's no jack. In there. <laughs> no, because most people don't do that in their closet. I, th 
I okay. think I found a segue for us. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can totally hear you. Okay. So I just put the things that I highlighted on pages five and six are okay. where I was thinking I could go. I have one more uh, prompt. Yep. It's the what it's the what now, and then you have your cultural religious part here. Cool. And then I was gonna go into so my what now was this. My sponsor and therapist had me be single on mm -hmm. purpose. And then after you respond to that, scroll down to the top of six and I will go back to twelve step and therapy. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, yeah. Yeah. this is what we cool. want to talk cool. about next time we meet. Yeah. Cool? Yeah, I love it. All right. What was the last thing you were you were sharing on though? It was the rancor. It was the or the hatred. Yeah, and then cutting like cutting ties, cutting cords, um, energetically right, right. moving into an energetic the, space because right, they're right. so angry. Okay. Okay. Tell me when you're ready. Cool. Um, Brandon, we are back in. When I start speaking in a moment. All right, so I appreciate that share, Amy, and I know that my ex and I, I mean, coming from the backgrounds we came from, and since this is the Sean Solipsism show, uh, uh, you know, we had a lot. We had a lot of baggage. We had a lot to unpack ourselves. We had a lot of, you know, resentment, anger, all that shit from our families of origin anyway. So there's a lot for us to work on, and I'm pretty proud of how we've come around full circle to that. But I know it's not easy for folks. And again, that's why I asked you, you know, God, what do you do when someone's just on fire with hatred for their for their soon-to-be former partner? Um, and once that cools and once they mitigate that and you're working with them and they're going to therapy, they're doing the things that they need to do, then there's this big, oh, fuck, what now? And what do you tell folks right? The rage has cooled. Hopefully it wasn't even that bad in the first place, but you've worked through that. You're doing the mindfulness. What's one of the first things you say to them when they're like, oh my God, what now? What do I do? I don't have a partner. I have a, I'm in a new home, a new situation. Like so much has changed. What do you tell them about starting over? Um, okay. You know what, Sean? I think, okay, Brandon, I think we don't, we don't even need this part don't unless you think okay. yeah i don't think we need no, this because no. we because okay. we already talked about the spiritual and the culture or the the cultural religious that. whatever like yeah a while ago. So, yeah okay. so i think you can go right into the um the s Having i mean fantastic support and just going down to the to the sop part like once I work through. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, or you can, you can say, okay, so, so you go in, you, you, I think you can tie. I don't, I don't think I need to speak in here. I think you can tie the, okay. So you, cool you know, you, out, you cool down. You better, cause, cause I had to go through that. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. So, and then, and okay. then my sponsor had me do the SOP and how was, you know, yes. Okay. And then I can go into the excellent. All the, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you'll go into, you'll end out. Um, and then I'll bring up that we're going to come back together and then you're going to end it out. Okay. So wait. So I think you say this stuff about, okay, so you, you, once you cool down, awesome. Then, and I, you know, I went through that and then my sponsor and my therapist both had me do single on purpose for a while, whatever. And then I'll go in, I'll say, excellent. Um, you know, everyone's timeline is different depending on okay. da, 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 da. Um, and then after I finish I that, you can say, having... I can, the fantastic. Spring. Okay. Got it. Got it. Brandon, thank Sorry. you. <laughs> Sorry. Ignore the last, all the silent part, and then everything I just said. We are at um, fifty-three twenty-eight. So now we're starting back up again from the last time Amy was sharing on hatred and mm -hmm. uh, just contact us if there are any questions. <laughs> so, um, so thank you for that part of this share, Amy, because I, you know, coming from where I came from coming from where my ex came from, we both had a lot of baggage walking in. And so we had a lot of baggage we were taking with us out. And I specifically worked with my sponsor in 12 step and therapist after we were divorced. I had the rage stuff, the rancor and all that, you know, just on my own, you know, but it would come out on her. And so I had to go through the process that we were just talking about where you're working with someone to get through it. Um, and what my sponsor and therapist hit me with then, oh my God, within like weeks of it finally being over, 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 and I'm making all those adjustments. They're like, and you're not going to date anymore. 
I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, dude, I'm 40, whatever. I'm going to get out there. I'm going to make up for lost time. Right. I was like, woohoo. Uh, they were like, nope, you're going to be single on purpose, which taps right back into this podcast. And they didn't call it that. Um, and it was before the book, but it was really crucial, uh, Amy, to just do me mm -hmm. for a year plus even stay out of the field. <laughs> like, don't go back into the jungle work on you, you, you. And, um, oh my God, it was a super intense experience. Again, I wanted to get out there. Um, it also showed, you know, ego and attachment to my ex and no, 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 she's out there dating. I want to go out there dating. So there's a little comparative stuff. What, um, <laughs> yeah. what do you think about that? The process yeah. of getting reintroduction, like reintegration, solo or dating, whatever. I think it's excellent that your sponsor and your therapist suggested a year not dating. Um, and, and yes, your ego feeds into that and your friends and your family are probably like, you got to get out there. And, um, friends who are still married are kind of envious and they want it, you know, they want the single, the single dating life. And it looks, however, um, I, I always suggest that it will probably be about a year before you start to feel comfortable in your own skin again. And most people want to shortcut this process. I know I did. But if you don't take that single on purpose pause for about a year, the pause may come later. Meaning if you rush into a relationship to fill a void or to distract yourself or to feed into your ego, that relationship likely won't last. So my advice is take the time to heal, to meditate, to be good to yourself. From a mindful perspective, this can be a really beautiful opportunity for reflection and self-discovery and growth uh, and healing. Mm, thank you for that. Yeah, I, as a sex and love addiction coach, you know that the people that are suddenly single, especially if it was a marriage or who have addiction issues or whatever, they, you know, everyone wants a rebound. Everyone wants that, like, you know, just get right back out there, get a quickie in, you know, something loose and casual or whatever. It's so common. And there's, and with the addiction stuff too, there's in the code of there's all that enmeshment. Well, let me just get enmeshed again right away. So I'm really grateful that that year, Amy, felt like a fucking attorney. Well, at the start, it felt like the attorney, but by the time you get to like a couple months in, I was like, no, this is cool because I can really just, I, I call it like self-ist. I wasn't self-ish, I was self-ist. I was yes. like, oh, dude, I can just focus on me. I'm yeah. like, I'm in, I'm in my middle life, my middle age. Okay. And, you know, I worked out and I was like, I'm really good by the time I you know, get back out there or whatever. So there were some upshots, but it yes. was difficult. And it was wonderful, the support I had in that process. And I wish that for everybody, for yeah. people like you, for people like John, Vanessa, a lot of the people in our in our our cohort, Single on Purpose, uh, the Angry Therapist, all these groups. Um, because I think it's very American to just try to do this stuff solo. And so I was so grateful for the sponsor I had, the 12 step sponsor, um, you know, working through my, now I had to be a recovering sex addict, love addict, single and on purpose. And so I think, Amy, you and I both have, I've attested, you know, I, I share my love of tw the 12 step process all the time and its principles. And I think the next time we're wrapping up this share, but the next time we come together, we're going to share a little more specifically on 12 step. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to that. It's going to be amazing. I like to say that um, 12 step didn't um, save my marriage, but it saved my life. So maybe that can be sort of a springboard in this next one. And I want to thank you so much for sharing all of your experience, strength and hope. It's a big 12 step thing we say and listening to your voice. You have such a great, uh, like jazz radio <laughs> podcast voice. Likewise. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to put you more in the hot seat next time though. I'm okay. gonna, we're going to get some more of your dirt going, but thank you so much. <laughs> thank uh, you, Sean. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was awesome. Good... Yeah. I'm really excited about the, uh, the 12 step episode as well. It'll be fantastic. All right. We'll do it soon. Take care, Amy. Thanks, Sean.